to Dafyomi one week at a time, Masachet Megillah. Uh, this is our first lesson in Masachet Megillah, so we're going to start with a quick introduction, uh, and then we are going to review Daf uh, two uh, through nine again. For those of you new to Dafyomi and to Gemara, uh, Gemaras start on Daf two, not on Daf one. Uh, the idea is a beautiful idea that we're never. Uh, we're never really beginning or ending our learning. Uh, we are always constantly uh, learning, and therefore it's as if you already learned the first page, and we're going to start on page two. Um, but just a, a quick introduction um, to Masachat Megillah. As you can see in the slide um, that Web Yeshiva beautifully made, uh, there's a picture of uh, Megillat Esther behind me. And um, that, in essence, is the theme uh, for our Masachet. We are going to be discussing uh, the laws that have to do with the festival of Purim. Um, Purim, of course, uh, is, is uh, discussed in Megillat Esther. Megillat Esther was the book written by uh, Queen Esther, uh, it, talking about the history of, or I should say, the uh, miraculous um, the miraculous saving of the Jewish people. And um, we, in the beginning of this Masechet, will be discussing uh, when we read the Megillah, who reads the Megillah, uh, who is obligated to read the Megillah. Um, throughout this, this Masechet, we will be discussing um, reading the Megillah. Uh, then we are going to move on to the other um, mitzvot, the other commandments that have to do with uh, the festival of Purim, uh, specifically um, Mishloach Manot, giving uh, food to uh, our friends, uh, Matanot Evionim, giving charity to poor people, um, and having a seuda, uh, a, a festive meal on Purim. Uh, there are various laws uh, that uh, pertain to each one of these, and we will we will discuss them in this Megillah, in this Masechet. Um, the first chapter that we're going to begin um, is going to discuss, um, today we're going to, to discuss when the Megillah is read, and then um, we're going to start a very interesting section. Uh, I guess I'll explain it when we get there. Uh, next week, probably, uh, the, the second half of the first chapter really goes in depth uh, looking at Megillat Esther and all the stories or the Midrashim that you've heard um, based on Megillat Esther are actually found in this Masachet. Um, so let's begin. Um, we are going to begin, as I said, on Daf 2 uh, with the Mishnah. So the Mishnah uh, begins again uh, when we learn Gemara, we are first going to learn uh, the Mishnah. Uh, and then the Gemara is going to try to understand uh, what the Mishnah is referring to. So the first Mishnah tells us that you can read Megillat Esther uh, any time from the 11th till the 15th of Adar. Uh, Adar usually being uh, the month in February or March, depending on the, on the year. Um, and between the 11th and the 15th, uh, we are familiar with Purim falling out on the 14th uh, of Adar, and uh, that we will explain what this Mishnah is talking about. Um, the Gemara says you cannot read it before the 11th, uh, and you cannot read it after the 15th, meaning those are uh, the, the earliest and the latest that you can read it. Um, cities with walls from the time of Yehoshua, of Joshua, from the, the, the Tanakh, um, those cities read the uh, Megillah on the 15th. Uh, if those of you are familiar with the idea of what we call Shushan Purim, Shushan Purim falls out on the 15th. Uh, if anybody has ever been in Israel um, during the Purim um, season, so uh, Yerushalayim actually uh, keeps Shushan Purim on the 15th. Um, so that is when um, they read. Um, cities and villages will read in general on the 14th, um, but they could read earlier on what's called Yom HaKnisa, which literally means the day that they enter. Uh, this is Monday and Thursday. Monday and Thursdays were market days, uh, and those were the days that the, the villagers came into the main cities. Uh, and the Mishnah tells us that um, 
when they came into the city, they could hear Megillah on that day, if it was earlier than, um, than uh, Puri, meaning from the 11th to the 14th. Um, so, right, if the 14th, and then the Gemara basically goes through um, every permutation, right, the, the Mishnah, sorry, right, so if Purim falls out, uh, the 14th falls out on a Monday, so then you read that day, and then the walled cities read on the 15th. Uh, if Purim, the 14th, falls out on Tuesday or Wednesday, so then the villagers will read on Monday, meaning the Monday before, the city uh, people will read on the 14th and the walled cities will read on the 15th. Uh, if it falls out on Thursday, everybody reads on the 14th and the walled on the 15th. Uh, if it falls out on Friday, um, the villagers will read on the, thir- on the Thursday before, meaning the day before, and everyone else on the 14th. We're going to see uh, that on Shabbat, it becomes complicated. We do not read the Megillah on Shabbat. Um, and therefore on Shabbat, the villagers and the city read on Thursday, and the walled walled uh, cities read on Sunday. Um, and on, if it falls out on Sunday, the villagers read on the Thursday before. That's the eleventh, meaning that's the earliest permutation. The cities on the fourteenth, uh, meaning on Sunday, and then the walled cities on the fifteenth. And uh, we'll have a chart about this in uh, in a minute. Um, so now to the Gemara. So the sages were lenient for the villagers to read earlier so that they can provide food and drink for the city people on um, on Purim. And therefore, they were able to read earlier. Um, okay. Um, there's a, a, I would say, linguistic reason. And here they... Uh, the Gemara goes back to the Megillah and tells us that because it says the word uh, reading the Megillah in their time, everybody should read it in their appropriate time. Um, But as we saw, uh, there are some leniencies in terms of reading it earlier. Um, We said that you could read it on Monday and Thursday. Uh, I said it was market day, but it's also the day that the courts uh, sat in session, uh, and that's why, um, and that's why uh, they could read on those days. Um, the Gemara asks again. We said it walled cities from the time of Yoshua. Uh, it's interesting because we would think that it should be walled cities from the time of Shushan, right? Shushan is the capital city of Persia. It's where our story takes place. Um, so we should think that uh, it should be from the time of Shushan. Um, and the Gemara says, um, no, um, we're going to say it's from the time of Yehoshua, meaning much earlier, right? Uh, the, Joshua is much earlier than, uh, than the story of Purim um, because of the words used in the Megillah. Uh, the, the words are, the cities are called uh, open cities, and the same word is used in Yehoshua. And therefore, the Gemara says uh, that um, all walled cities from the time of Yoshua read on the 15th, like Shushan, right? Again, if you were in Shushan, um, then, um, then you, would read, uh, you would read on the 15th. Um, from here, uh, the Gemara talks about um, things that were instituted by uh, the prophets. Uh, the, the Gemara says that um, the letters that we have in Hebrew at the end of a word, right? That change, right? A mem uh, at the end of a word becomes what we would call a mem sofit, a final mem. Uh, We have uh, mem, nun, samech, um, mem, mem, nun, uh, and then pei and kaf. Um, So these letters um, are end letters and they were were instituted by the prophets. Um, the Gemara on Daf 3 says, what do you mean they were instituted by the prophet? We know that um, when the, the tablets, the Luchot, uh, were given to Moshe, to Moses on Sinai, um, the, the Gemara tells us that uh, the Mem, right, interestingly, right, if you think about a block letter Mem that goes at the end of the word, 
um, if it was carved into stone all the way through, then that little square in the middle would be kind of suspended, right? So the Gemara tells us that that little piece of stone miraculously stood there, um, which would imply that um, this letter existed before the prophet. Um, so the Gemara says, you're right, it was there before, um, but um, it was it was forgotten. They weren't sure where this letter went, if it went in the middle of the word or at the end, and that was instituted by the prophet. Um, okay, uh, from here, the Gemara starts talking about, as we were talking about prophets, who was greater, uh, Daniel or Chagai Zcharia and Melachi, uh, and there were um, there were there's a discrepancy as to which which of the prophets were were greater. Um, okay, from here the Gemara goes into a, a discussion about um, taking precedence between different mitzvot between different commandments. Uh, I here I brought for you a number of charts uh, that I got from um, the Dafyomi Adma Advancement Forum. Um, this is a, a really great website, uh, Dafyomi, I think, dot il, something like that, but Dafyomi Advancement Forum, you can Google them, they're excellent, uh, really great references. Uh, so they have a whole bunch of charts, so we're going to see a few charts today. Um, so the Gemara discusses what takes precedence when we have a um, conflict between different um, different um, mitzvot. So the Gemara tells us that um, the Kohanim, the priests in the in the temple in the Beit Hamikdash, would stop working in order to hear the Megillah, uh, and therefore we should also um, stop. We should also stop working uh, when we uh, when we it's time to hear the Megillah. Uh, we are on Daf three now, and the Torah says that we should also. Again, we don't. Uh, we are not working in the temple, but the the Gemara tells us that we should stop learning Torah in order to go hear the Megillah. Uh, and here the Gemara talks about avoda. Avoda here means um, the 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 work in the temple in the Beit Hamikdash. It's more stringent than learning Torah and. Um, and if that's the case, then if they stopped uh, working in order to hear the Megillah, uh, then we should stop learning Torah in order to hear the Megillah. Um, and uh, the same thing in terms of um, in terms of uh, what about right? So we said the Megillah is more important. It's more important to hear the Megillah uh, than it is to learn Torah. Uh, and therefore, um, the Gemara then asks, what about burying uh, what's called a mate mitzvah? Mate mitzvah is somebody who, uh, is, uh, who has died and has no relatives to bury them, meaning uh, you see a dead body, this, um, this takes precedence over any other mitzvah. Uh, and therefore, right, mate mitzvah, is definitely before Talmud Torah, meaning you stop learning Torah in order to bury uh, this person. What about listening to Megillah and uh, the Meit Mitzvah? Um, so the Gemara says, uh, and this is a beautiful concept, um, the concept of um, Kavod Habriot. Uh, that means that we uh, we value uh, the the lives of people or we value people's um, uh, dignity, and that really trumps uh, almost everything. Uh, and here the, the question is, Megillah, uh, we are supposed to be um, publicizing the uh, amazing miracle that happened on Purim, uh, and we have the other side of the, the coin, which is uh, this body that needs to be, uh, that needs to be buried. Uh, and therefore, um, if you uh, if you cannot bear if you cannot read the Megillah afterwards, uh, if you can read the Megillah afterwards, then uh, you need to bury this person. Uh, if and if it is not uh, possible to read the Megillah uh, and you would miss your opportunity completely, you actually read the Megillah first and then uh, bury the body. Um, from here, um, the Gemara talks about we talked about a walled city. 
reading the Megillah on the 15th of Adar, what we call um, what we call Shushan Purim. Um, the Gemara adds to this that it's not only the people who live within the walls, uh, it's also um, the, the city or the, maybe the villages or the people who live near, uh, near the city and can see the city. Uh, and therefore, um, they too are, are considered um, part of the walled city. Um, from here, the Gemara talks about what is considered uh, a city as opposed to a village. Uh, again, we, we saw this in the Mishnah that we have the concept of a city and a village. Uh, the Gemara says that a city uh, is um, a place where at least 10 people uh, sit in the shul and they are there, uh, they do not work, and they're there to, to, to pray, to make a minyan, uh, a minion for whoever needs. Um, and then if you have less than 10 people who are, who are available for that service, uh, your, uh, your area is considered a village and you can go into the city uh, to hear Megillah on Monday or Thursday. Um, from here, Duff 4 uh, talks about different cities uh, that had walls uh, and that they read also on the 15th, right? Lod being one of them. Uh, they had a wall from the time of Yehoshua, and therefore uh, they read the Megillah on the 15th. Um, the Gemara tells us on Daf 4 that uh, women read, um, need to hear the Megillah, and, um, and they, why, would, why do they need to read the Megillah? Um, because or hear the Megillah, um, because they were involved in the miracle, right? Af hin hayu beoto hanes means they were involved in the miracle. Uh, of course, there are two ways to understand this. One is that they were saved, just like the men were saved. They too were saved. Uh, the other is um, because they actually brought about the miracle, right? This is very obvious in the in the in Purim. In Purim, we have uh, Esther who literally saves the day, um, and therefore women must hear Megillat, uh, Megillat Esther. Um, we need to read the Megillah at night and during the day. Again, this is based on the verse. Um, okay, from here, the Gemara um, um, goes back to the Mishnah and talks about, um, based on when the 14th is, uh, who reads when? Uh, and there is a machloket, as you can see here, um, that uh, it's actually a three-way machloket, um, whether um, when, Shab when Purim on the 14th, if it falls out on a, a Friday or Shabbat, um, so then um, the question is, when does everybody read? Again, the assumption is that um, you do not read on Shabbat, um, but uh, again, we're going to say that, um, as I mentioned before, the uh, cities, the regular cities are going to read uh, the day before the 14th, uh, if the 14th is on Shabbat, and um, also the, the walled cities are going to try to read on the 15th if they can. Uh, if not, uh, then the, again, everybody moves back. As I mentioned before, um, nobody goes past the 15th, so you're not going to push it ahead. You're always going to get go backwards. So that's this chart uh, here in front of you, um, and it, and you can see how uh, there is a difference of opinion when everybody reads. Uh, again, nowadays this is uh, less, um, I would say, less complicated. We do not have the concept of um, villagers. Uh, we do have the concept of uh, regular cities and walled cities, and in essence, this really is uh, what we do, that um, we read on, uh, on Friday if it falls out on Friday, and the walled cities will also read on Friday if it falls out on Friday. Um, okay, uh, as I mentioned at the bottom of four, the Gemara tells us that everyone agrees that we do not read on Shabbat because not everybody knows how to read and therefore if you get stuck um, you might carry it to an expert and ask him to teach you how to read it. The same thing with Shofar and Lulav. We have um, those of you who have been learning uh, since the beginning of 
uh, the cycle, right? We did learn about lulav in Masachet Sukkah, and we did learn about shofar in Masachet Rosh Hashanah. So, kol kavod to all of you who have learned that already. Um, the other reason that the Gemara gives us for not reading on Shabbat is very interesting. Um, the Gemara tells us that poor people connect reading the Megillah with charity. As I mentioned in, the, in our introduction, um, we, there's a special uh, mitzvah of giving what's called matanot le'evyonim, right, uh, charity to the poor on Purim. Uh, and the poor people see when you read the Megillah, you're going to give charity. If you'd read on Shabbat, uh, and then they come and you don't give them charity, uh, there, there is a problem, right? So they, they don't, they're confused, they don't understand, uh, and therefore um, read early. Uh, and if you read earlier, then the mitzvah of matanot um, le'avionim, of giving the charity, um, goes together on the day that you read the Megillah. Okay, um, Daf 5 tells us about um, simcha, right? We need to be happy. Uh, remember, we talked about at the end of Ta'anit, we talked about Mishenichnas um, Adar Marbim Besimcha, right? When we go into Adar, uh, we increase in our happiness. So here, Simcha on the top of Da 5 tells us that we need to have a Seuda, a festive meal, um, on the 14th, on Purim itself, during the day. Um, so as we said, on the 14th, um, you, read, uh, you read the Megillah. And here, again, as I mentioned, one aspect of reading is um, publicizing the miracle, Pursume Nisa, right? We discussed this um, for Hanukkah as well with lighting the candles on Hanukkah. Um, the same thing is with Megillah. So here the Gemara asks, um, what's better, um, reading it by yourself on the 14th or reading it earlier Right, and uh, if you read it earlier, then you must do so with 10 people. Uh, or, says the Gemara, maybe you always need 10 people. Okay, the next Mishnah on uh, Da 5 tells us, again, as I mentioned, a large city is where 10 people, um, there are 10 people who are called Batlanim, who sit and they uh, make the minion. If it's less than that, it's considered a village uh, where they can um, read earlier. Um, okay, um, the Gemara tells us that sometimes we push things ahead and other times we push them, um, I guess, before, right, earlier. Um, so as we said, um, Purim, we always push or bring a pull beforehand. We're going to read, as we said, 11, 12, uh, 13. Um, but as we mentioned, Tisha Be'av, if that falls out on Shabbat, we're going to push it to the next day. So that would be the difference um, between um, Purim and other days. Um, okay, um, then... Uh, hold on a second. Ah, um, the, the Mishnah also tells us that on the day that you read Megillah, if it's not the 14th, right, if you moved it um, earlier, you can say eulogies. Um, and only if you go into the city on Monday and Thursday, then you can read on Monday or Thursday. If that's not the custom of your village, then you have to say it on the regular day. Um, okay. Um, the Ah. So now the Gemara says, as we mentioned, uh, we said Tisha B'Av, we don't move it forward to Friday, we push it ahead to Sunday. The question is why? Um, the Gemara says that we don't commemorate tragedy early, right? We wait till the day of the tragedy. If we can't commemorate it then, we will go to the next day. We don't make it earlier, right? Um, holidays also, um, we push them off. We don't make them earlier. Um, Okay, um, hold on one second. Okay. I'm just going to skip because we have a lot of things to do. Um, okay, the next concept is the idea of not working on Purim. Um, the, the Gemara says that um, not everybody accepted to not work on Purim, and therefore uh, it really depends where you live. If in your area there's a custom not to work on Purim, right, in Israel, um, I think most businesses are closed. 
Uh, there's definitely no school, uh, and therefore um, you don't go to work or go to school. I imagine in other places that is not necessarily the case. Um, okay, um, here uh, we're now going to talk about other cities. Um, so Tveria is, um, they were not sure if it was considered a walled city, uh, and therefore uh, they they read on the 14th and the 15th uh, because they weren't sure if it's considered a walled city because on one hand it did have a wall, um, but um, it didn't have a wall all the way around the city because on one side it had the sea, uh, and therefore maybe it's not considered a walled city. Um, um, and then there are other cities in Binyamin that are also mentioned um, that, and the question is, were they considered walled or not? Um, and from here, DAF 6, uh, we have a discussion about um, different cities known by different names. Uh, so you can look it up. I'm not going to go through all of them, but uh, they bring up um, the different cities and, and what they're known as in different uh, contexts. Um, we, uh, from here, they talk about Caesarea, right? Caesarea, Caesarea. And um, the Gemara says that um, Caesarea, which was basically um, a, a beautiful Roman city in Israel, uh, and I would say a symbol of Roman power uh, and Jerusalem, right? Obviously, the, the symbol of the, the center of Judaism. Uh, and here the Gemara says that um, these two cities cannot be uh, at their height at the same time. Either Caesarea is doing well and Jerusalem is suffering, or the opposite, meaning we are polar opposites, and therefore um, that is just the way uh, life goes. They can't both be uh, high or both be low. Um, um, from here, ah, and since we said something about like, um, don't believe someone if they say that they saw uh, Jerusalem and Caesarea in their height, in its height, uh, the Gemara continues and says, don't believe someone who says, I worked hard and I didn't succeed, right? Or, but I didn't succeed, right? Or the opposite, uh, you know, I didn't work hard uh, and I did succeed, right? The Gemara says, no, that's not the case. The case is if you work hard, you will succeed. Uh, the Gemara, of course, says that's really about Torah, right? If you learn a Torah and you put in the effort, the results will come to you no matter what. Um, but if we're talking about success in business, uh, um, the Gemara says that that's really up to God. Uh, and it's, you know, we have to put in our efforts, um, but ultimately uh, God is the one that uh, determines uh, how successful we are. Um, okay, uh, since we're talking about Caesarea, then the Gemara talks about Rome and how it's such a huge city uh, with so many markets and um, that the people uh, received money from the king and that there were 3,000 uh, bathhouses and 500 windows and the, on the city uh, limit. And basically it was such a great city or so large. Um, okay, let's move on to the next, uh, the next Mishnah. Okay, the next Mishnah talks about um, Adar. Now Adar uh, is very unique in the sense that um, when we have a Jewish leap year, which by the way is this year, uh, when we have a Jewish leap year, uh, an entire month of Adar is added. So we have Adar Aleph, number one, and Adar Bet, right, Adar two. Uh, the question of course is, which is the real Adar? When do we, um, when do we observe uh, the mitzvot of Purim? Uh, and that is what our Mishnah is going to discuss. Okay, so the, ah, and another thing to understand is that uh, they, they didn't always, again, nowadays we know in advance when it's going to be a leap year. We have calendars, we have calculations. Uh, in those days, as we saw in Masachat uh, Rosh Hashanah, um, they only determined if it would be a leap year um, actually in Adar. Um, so let's say Adar started, and then you thought it was only one Adar, so you kept Purim, and then at the end of Adar, they're like, ah, oh, just kidding, we're adding another one. So then the question is, do you repeat it or not? So that's going to be our question. So um, the Gemara says that if you read Megillah in Adar, and then they added another Adar, 
you need to read it again. Uh, and here we're going to start um, the next session section of the Gemara, which is famously called Ein Bain. Right? Ein Bain means there isn't a difference. Um, and what we're going to do, and uh, obviously we're going to start with a Purim-related topic, and we are quickly going to go completely off topic. Um, but the idea in the Gemara here is, um, stylistically, we're going to compare two similar things and say they are so similar except for this one thing or two things. But in all other things, they are the same. So here we go, right? Ein bein, right? The only difference between Adar 1 and Adar 2 is that Megillah and Matanot Evionim are done in um, Adar, uh, is, that's the difference, okay? And that, um, that uh, sorry, um, uh, uh, okay, and that the four special uh, parshiot, the four special Torah readings that we read, uh, those are only done in Adar Aleph, and you don't need to repeat them. Okay, the Gemara continues, and here you can see in the chart uh, that it's not so simple. It's actually a three-way um, machloket, um, where uh, the question is, do you need to repeat the mitzvot in the second Adar? Right? Everybody agrees that you cannot fast or eulogize on the 14th or 15th of Adar 1 or 2, right, in both of them. They're both considered special days. Uh, the question is, when do we do the actual mitzvot? Um, the four parshiot, right, that's um, parshat, um, we have Shabbat, uh, we have Shabbat, Shkalim, uh, um, Para, Zachor, and HaChodesh, um, and those are said uh, really in Adar Bet, in the second Adar, um, but the Gemara says maybe you can do it in the first, uh, also Megillah, or no, um, you actually need to read all of those things in Adar Bet. Um, and again, right, these, uh, these ideas, the, the four parshiot, as you can see, it goes from Adar into Nisan, into uh, preparing for Pesach, uh, and therefore, it should be done in Adar Bet, in Adar number two, as opposed to in Adar one, right? The other opinion is, no, you should do everything in Adar one because we don't want to skip over mitzvot, right? As soon as we have an opportunity to do a mitzvah, we should do it uh, as soon as possible. And therefore, that there is an argument to do it in the first Adar. Um, Daf 7 um, says that... Um, that the Megillah says you need to keep it every year. What is every year? Again, Adar 1 or Adar 2. Um, from here, the Gemara tells us that Esther was asked by the, um, Esther asked the sages to institute Purim. Um, they didn't want the nations to be upset. They thought maybe uh, people would get upset if we instituted this festival. Um, and she said, or, you know, or write it down in Megillah Sasser. And she said, they know the story already, so we might as, write it down. We might as well write it down. Um, and therefore, um, the book of Esther is written down. Since we're talking about the book of Esther, uh, the Gemara tells us on Daf 7 that um, books of Tanakh um, actually make your hands tame. This is not the case nowadays, um, but in those days, uh, they wanted to make sure that people were very careful with their uh, Torah scrolls uh, and that they wouldn't store food near them. Uh, and therefore, uh, they said that if you touch a Torah scroll, your hands would become tameh. Again, not now, nowadays, that is not the, the case. Um, and since we're discussing um, books of Tanakh, the question is, one opinion is that Esther does not make your hands tameh, which would imply it's not part of Tanakh. And the Gemara says, no, that is not true. Um, Esther is part of the Tanakh, and it was written with prophecy, um, and therefore um, it does make your hands tameh. Um, so too, and there's a disagreement about Kohelet, um, um, Ecclesiastes, um, or Shir Hashirim, uh, right, the Song of Songs. Uh, these two books 
um, are slightly controversial in the sense that um, Kohelet seems to be a book of wisdom and not necessarily one of um, divine inspiration. Uh, of course, um, the Gemara says, no, uh, these books were written with divine inspiration. They are part of Tanakh uh, and they do, um, they do make your hands tameh um, if you touch them in those days. Um, okay, um, and, and from here, um, the Gemara ex um, actually gives um, examples on how we know that um, the the Megillah, Megillah Esther, was written prophetically, right? There, there are certain verses that seem to that talk about how Haman felt in his heart, right? How would Esther know how Haman felt in his heart, or that um, Mordechai understood uh, what the two um, traitors were plotting? Of course, then the Gemara says, "No, I can explain all those things rationally. Uh, those things are obvious." to understand and didn't need um, prophecy to understand them. Um, from here, um, the Gemara um, does actually end up by saying, no, there really are proofs that uh, the Megillah was written with a uh, divine inspiration. Okay, um, let's talk about the other mitzvot of Purim. Um, mishloach manot, you should send mishloach, means you send one th thing, um, you, you send one to one person, you send once uh, manot, two food items. Uh, therefore, um, mishloach manot means giving two portions or two food items to one other person. Um, matanot is plural, so two matanot, um, two, two aniim, matanot le'evyonim. Um, so therefore, we give two um two portions to two different people, uh, and that is giving charity uh, on Purim. Um, the Gemara tells us that you should give um, um, choice food, wine, things that can be eaten right away. Um, and um, interesting right here, the Gemara on Daf 7 tells us that you should become intoxicated on Purim. Uh, I don't know how much I love that, but okay, you should be intoxicated on Purim um, till you don't know the difference, right? This is the source of not knowing the difference between blessed is Mordechai, Baruch Mordechai, to Arur Haman, right? Cursed is Haman. And here is a terrible, tragic story, which I think proves that you should not drink on Purim. Um, but uh, Rabbah and Rabbi Zera uh, had their festive meal together on Purim. They got very drunk, and Rabbah actually kills Rabbi Zera, accidentally, of course. Uh, the next day, he realized what he did. Uh, he prays, and he actually brings him back to life, miraculously. The next year, he invites him over again. What do you think he said? Right? Of course, he's like, uh, no thanks. I think once was enough. And um, he says, right, we don't rely on miracles, as we saw in the last Masechet, in Masechet Ta'anit, and therefore he, uh, he basically uh, says no thank you to that invitation. Um, okay, um, since we discussed, again, as I said, Ein Bain, so now we're going to do uh, different things uh, that are seemingly similar but have some differences. So there's no difference um, between Shabbat and Yom Tov and a festival, except for food preparation, right? We know that on the festival, you are allowed to prepare food. On Shabbat, you are not, right? Um, but preliminary food preparation cannot be done on either one. Okay, next Mishnah, we're going to do these quickly till they get a little bit more complicated. Um, the next one is, there's no difference between Shabbat and Yom Kippur, um, except for if you transgress intentionally on Shabbat, you are, um, um, your chayav, uh, death by, uh, by baiting, right? People are going to charge you um, to the death penalty. But if you do so on Yom Kippur, the death that you would receive is from God, called karet, that is from God. Um, but uh, the Gemara says that for both of them, um, you don't need to pay for damages that you did on that day um, because of a very uh, interesting rule in the Gemara. Um, in Aramaic, the rule is kimle bidiraba mine. Uh, that means that if you are uh, liable 
uh, in one action, if you did something that is liable for two different punishments, uh, one we would say a capital punishment, the other would be uh, a monetary uh, punishment, right? Some sort of uh, negligence uh, or uh, some sort of financial um, punishment. So if you are um, uh, liable for both of them, you only are liable for the more stringent thing and not for the um, the more lenient thing, right? And therefore, um, right, you don't get both punishments. You only get the more stringent uh, punishment. Okay. Um, daf eight. Um, okay. Daf eight. The next ain bane. So the only difference between someone who takes a vow to not have any benefit from somebody, as opposed to someone who takes a vow to not eat from somebody, from a particular person, um, right? So again, one would ask, why are you taking this vow? Um, it's an excellent question. Uh, I think that it is a way to show control. Uh, it is a way to uh, really show somebody that you're really upset, right? I am, you know, I'm not coming to your house ever, or I'm not coming for the next month to your house because I'm really mad at what you just did. Uh, of course, uh, this is only if you use uh, the name of God in this uh, in this vow, right? If you take a real vow, please do not do this at home. It is very serious. Um, but what's the difference between general benefit and um, benefit from food? Uh, the only difference is that you can't walk on the person's property if you just if you mentioned um, benefit in general, um, and you cannot borrow regular vessels, right? But both of them can't use vessels that are um, uh, used for food preparation. Okay, next, uh, ain bain, right? There's the only difference between a neder and a nidava. Okay, we're, I'm going to explain this in a minute, but maybe I'll explain it now. Um, the, the Gemara explains it a few lines down, but I'll explain it now. Um, when a person wants to bring a sacrifice, there are two languages, there are two ways you can obligate yourself to bring a sacrifice. Um, one is called a neder, right, from the word vow. A neder is, um, you say that um, I uh, vow, to, I don't, but I, uh, hypothetically speaking, I vow to bring a uh, sacrifice uh, to God, right, a korban ola. I'm going to bring a sacrifice to God. Uh, it's it's my responsibility. Um, the other language you can use is a, in the language of a nidava, which is uh, I look at my uh, flock and I say, wow, that sheep is so beautiful. I vow to bring that sheep as a sacrifice to God. Um, both of those are uh, obligating me to bring a sacrifice. However, if I say, it's my responsibility, then uh, if the animal that I choose after that dies or gets lost, I need to get another animal to replace it. But if I say this animal, harezu, this animal is going to be an ola, that's called a nidava. And if that animal dies, I have no responsibility to bring another animal. Um, so that would be the difference between neder and nidava. Um, but both of them need to be brought at the right time. Okay, next. <laughs> um, sorry, I'm going quickly, but uh, it, it's, uh, there's a lot here, and uh, uh, we are going more on a tangent. We are uh, no longer talking about Purim anymore or the Megillah, uh, but this does give you a pretty broad understanding of um, Mishnah and Gemara. So our next Mishnah is going to talk about a Zav. Uh, a Zav in the Torah is described as um, a, a man who has a, an unnatural seminal emission. Uh, nowadays, we would call it gonorrhea, some sort of disease. Um, but the idea is that uh, when, um, when the man has this emission, um, he becomes tame, right? He becomes impure. He's called a Zav. Um, if it happens once, uh, then uh, he just goes to the mikvah that day, and that's the end of the story. If it happens twice, either twice in one day or um, twice within two days, um, he's called a zav, and now he becomes tameh, 
for seven days, impure for seven days, and then he goes to the mikvah. If it happens three times, again, either in one or two or three days, or three consecutive days, uh, then um, not only does he have to wait seven days to become pure, um, but he also brings a sacrifice on day eight. So here the Gemara tells us that the only difference between um, a Zav of two, uh, two emissions as opposed to three is that uh, the second one counts, um, the sec seeing twice counts seven days, Seeing three times counts seven days plus a sacrifice. Um, and here uh, the Gemara goes through um, the, the verses and explains uh, what is the source uh, for this law. But that is the law. Um, it is different for a woman who has um, a, a, a bloody discharge. Uh, she is called a Zava. Again, this is not when she's expecting her period as opposed to a Nida. Uh, these concepts do not exist nowadays. Um, again, Zav doesn't exist because we don't have the temple. Uh, Zava for a woman uh, doesn't really exist anymore because uh, the rabbis actually put the two laws of Nida and Zava together. Uh, and that's uh, the laws that we are keeping now of family, family purity of Tarata Mishpacha um, are a combination of these two uh, concepts. Okay. The next Mishnah uh, on Daf 8 talks about Sarat, uh, leprosy, uh, again, biblical uh, leprosy. And um, the, uh, the Gemara tells us that um, there are two types of, there are two types of uh, leprosy, um, or I should say, uh, okay, there's two types. Again, when someone got leprosy, it's important to understand, uh, they... Um, they were, again, impure, tame, and had to leave uh, the camp, the, the, the regular dwelling uh, that they were in. Again, we're talking about when the, the Jews were in the desert. Um, now, when, when, how did they determine if you had leprosy? You would call the priest, the Kohen, again, not the doctor. This is not a medical condition. This is a spiritual condition, uh, even though it has physical uh, um, uh, symptoms. Uh, so you ask the Kohen to come to your house to check if you had um, tzarat, uh leprosy. Uh, if he was sure, so then you were considered a, um, I guess, a real mitzora, a real leper, and you'd have to do the things that you had to do. If the Kohen was not sure, uh, then he would say, interestingly enough, stay in your house for seven days, and I'll come back in seven days, uh, and I'll check you again. This sounds familiar nowadays, uh, unfortunately. Um, but uh, this idea of quarantine is actually, interestingly enough, uh, a biblical concept. And um, after seven days, the Kohen would come back and check to see uh, if it got better or not, and then would determine either you had it, sarat, leprosy, or not. Uh, so here the Mishnah tells us, again, ein bain, there's no difference between uh, the regular leper and the one who we're not sure about who's in quarantine. Uh, the only difference is that um, the regular uh, leper needs to grow out uh, their hair and rip their clothing, and the other one does not, again, because he doesn't know if he really has uh, leprosy. Uh, again, biblical leprosy, tzara'at. And when they get out of tzara'at, meaning when they're finished uh, with the process, uh, then the real mitzora, the real leper, needs to shave his head and do a, a ceremony with these birds. Uh, the other one does not. He actually just uh, leaves uh, and goes back to his house. Um, but the Gemara says that both of them are sent from the camp and are equally tameh. And again, these are learned from specific verses. Okay, next. Uh, the next Mishnah is uh, the only difference between writing books of the Torah, of the Tanakh, and writing a mezuzah or tefillin is that the Tanakh can be written in different languages or maybe only in Greek. Um, and... Um, tefillin and mezuzah must be written in Hebrew and in uh, modern, uh, what, 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 we, what the Gemara calls Ashurit. You can see here Ashurit or Ashurit, 
but Ashurit. Um, Ktav Ashur is the way we write Hebrew nowadays. Um, there was an old Hebrew or ancient Hebrew called Ktav Ivri um, that you can look up. It's actually very cool. Uh, you can Google it. Um, so to write a Sefer Torah, to write a Torah scroll or a Mezuzah or a Tfilin must be written in Ashurit. Uh, here on this chart, Yivanit means Greek. Uh, so you can look here on the chart in terms of what can be Greek or not. Uh, the Gemara tells us that both of them must be sewn with sinews. Uh, if you've ever seen a Torah scroll or a Megillah, actually, um, they're, they're written on parchment uh, and sewn with sinews, with tendons from the animal, meaning it's all um, animal-based. It is, you can't use um, regular like cotton thread to sew uh, the pages together. Um, and um, again, they all make the hands tame. Um, so here the Brita tells us that the Torah must be written in Hebrew. Again, language and font, meaning the letters as well. And, be, and it has to be written on parchment with a certain type of ink to make it um, um, sanctified, to make it kadosh. Um, the Gemara and Daf 9 tells us that, again, it's important to understand that there's a difference between a Torah scroll, the way we understand a Torah scroll, and in those days, right, everything was written on parchment, meaning you could have a, um, the book of uh, Joshua in your, on your bookcase was not a, obviously, a leather-bound book with pages. It was a scroll. Um, so these scrolls, says the, the Gemara, that they can be written in foreign languages, but should be written in Hebrew font, which is interesting, almost like a transliteration using Hebrew letters. Um, the Megillah, as I mentioned, right, has to be written exactly the way it's written and, again, um, on parchment. Um, as I said, Tfilin and Mezuzah need to be written exactly the way they are written and in Hebrew. Um, the other books of Tanakh can be written in Greek as well. Um, so here you can see on the chart, uh, number one is a Sefer Torah, a Torah scroll. Number two, Nevi'im and Ketuvim, which means other books of uh, the Bible, right? Not the, the Torah scroll, but other books. Again, Megillat Aser, and then Tfilin and Mezuzah is number four. Um, very interesting, and I think famous story of Ptolemy the king, who um, took 72 sages and separated them and asked each one of them to translate the Torah into Greek. Um, right, this is the Septuagint. Uh, the idea here was that uh, he wanted to see if they were going to, um, you know, kind of change the Bible because uh, they were translating it into Greek. And interestingly enough, they actually did change the Bible, um, but all 72 uh, got uh, divine inspiration and miraculously all changed the exact same things. Um, and from here, uh, DAF 9 really gives us uh, a lengthy uh, um, discussion as to what verses they changed. Uh, and it's basically verses that if you read them, uh, I would say um, on the surface level, they are quite challenging, right? When we say, Breshit bara Elohim et hashamayim ve'et ha'aretz, right? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. One could think that it is the beginning created God who created the heavens and the earth, right? And they didn't want um, they didn't want him uh, to be confused to think that maybe we believed that there was something before God, uh, and therefore they changed the first verse of the Torah into God created the beginning. Uh, as opposed to, again, in the beginning. Uh, so it's interesting. Uh, if you can look on DAF, uh, DAF 9 for a list of all the things. Uh, the last thing, interestingly, uh, we talk about um, one of the animals that's not kosher is called an arnevet, right? A, a rabbit or a hare. Uh, they changed the word because arnevet was the name of the wife of the king, and they thought that uh, he would be insulted. They would think he would think that maybe they were making fun of his wife. So they changed the the word Arnevet, uh, the the rabbit, into a, a creature with short legs. 
so just fascinating uh, and how each and every sage, even though they were separated, um, translated the Torah in the same exact way. Um, since we're talking about Greece, uh, we mentioned uh, the verse in the Torah that says that uh, the words of Yefet, uh, right, of Yefet, which is really Greece, uh, will dwell in the tent of Shem, which is uh, the Jewish people. So what does it mean that the words of Greek will dwell with uh, with the Jewish people, right? One can understand it in, as uh, you can translate the Torah into Greek. Again, in the time of the, the Gemara, uh, Greek is the leading culture. Uh, it's seen as uh, very intellectual, very advanced. So it's interesting to really understand. Uh, and I think it's a very complex relationship that the Gemara has uh, between uh, the Greek language or Greek philosophy um, to uh, Judaism. So it's interesting uh, that comes from here. Um, okay, two more Mishnayot. Uh, one is about the Kohen Gadol, the high priest. Um, originally, the high priest was anointed with a special oil. Uh, later on, that oil was lost, and the only way they could become um, a high priest was to actually wear the clothes of the high priest. So the Gemara says the only difference between these two high priests um, is the sacrifice of the high priest um, that is brought if they make a mistake. Uh, the high priest who is anointed would bring a uh, an ox, uh, whereas the the high priest of just who was not anointed would bring a regular uh, korban chatat, a regular sin offering. Um, okay, uh, we have this idea of a current high priest and the substitute high priest. What happened? There was a regular high priest. He became impure for whatever reason. They brought in someone as a substitute. Uh, then he recovered, so he goes back to his original job. What happens to that substitute? Uh, unfortunately, it's actually quite tragic because there can't really be two high priests, and he was really only the substitute, so he can't be a high priest. He also can't go back to being a regular priest because once you're a high priest, we said you go up in sanctity in Kedusha and you don't go down. So unfortunately, he's really complicated. Uh, we don't know really what to do with him. And uh, uh, yeah, it's uh, not clear what, what happens with him. Um, last Mishnah that we're going to do today um, is talking about a Bama. Bama in modern Hebrew means a stage. Uh, in the Mishnah, it means an altar that was outside of the temple. Uh, sometimes these altars were permitted. Uh, again, in general, all sacrifices need to be done in the temple. Um, but uh, before the temple was built or in between the two temples, um, the large Bama was the altar in the Mishkan, in the tabernacle. Um, the small Bama is a private a altar that you might have in your backyard. Um, those were not allowed. Um, and uh, at a certain point in time, they were allowed. So the, the Mishnah tells us that the only difference between the large and the small Bama um, was Korban Pesach. Um, it could all, right, the, the, the Pesach uh, sacrifice, that could only be done on the altar uh, in the tabernacle, in the Mishkan. You couldn't do it in your backyard. Um, right, nedero uh, nidava, right, which we just learned about, of uh, voluntary uh, sacrifices could be brought on a small bama on the pri again. I did this, but it doesn't mean that. It means private. Uh, so those could be right. A voluntary uh, sacrifice can be brought on your private altar. All other um, all other sacrifices are only brought on the large. Uh, altar again the things that are obligatory uh, things that are like the Pesach not only the Pesach but anything that's like the Pesach can only be brought on the large altar in the Mishkan in the tabernacle Woo. okay uh, with that I wish everybody a uh, a, a great week a Shavua Tov uh, we will pick it up next week uh, this was this was uh, a lot of dopim, uh, but uh, next week we will do uh, only one week. This was a little bit more than a week. So uh, looking forward to continue learning uh, with you next week. Wishing everybody a, uh, a great week. Shavuot Tov, everyone.